<clears throat> this is the rules committee meeting for August. Wow, what a fast month. Uh, Councilor Hargis, would you give a blessing? Thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings that you bestow upon us. And we ask you to guide and direct each of our thoughts and our decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Councilor. Roll call, Shelly. Yes, sir. <coughs> Honey. Brian Warner. Honey. Bill England. Honey. Keith Austin. Here. Harley Bezer. Sean Crittenden. Mike Dobbins. Here. Frankie Hargis. Present. Wanda Hatfield. Uh, honey. Rex Jordan. Here. Dick Lay. Honey. Mike Shambaugh. Here. Mary Bakershaw. Honey. Joe Smith. Here. Janice Taylor. Here. Victoria Vesquez. Honey. David Walkenstick. Honey. <clears throat> Councillor Crittenden wanted me to relay to you that he had a uh, responsibility <clears throat> at the school. He had to take care of it today, so he probably will not be here. Okay, at this time, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Motion. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. We'll go down to reports. Uh, Marshal Shannon Buell. I know you've got a busy weekend ahead of you. Yes, we do. Good afternoon. Uh, besides what's in the report, I do have an accomplishment report that we got it too late for us to put in the written report. Uh, but at uh, the Cherokee Nation Child Support Services uh, with us, uh, joined together to create an environment to encourage Cherokee citizens to work together to provide futures for their children within Cherokee Nation. One of the things we've done was we uh, implemented a, a warrant amnesty program. What that means is it allows a specific time frame for fathers or mothers to approach Cherokee Nation Child Support Services or the Marshal Service to resolve child support responsibilities without the fear of being arrested. So those are one of the things that we look critical on. <coughs> the best outcome for our tribal members it would be to, to support uh, their youth. Uh, and not do it by sitting in jail. So one of the things we looked at is initially, let's, let's try to work as, as a family and as a, as a group to help this family out. And then later on, if we can't, then we can't. But at least uh, I, I hope that it is a good hand forward, a good, uh, a good step forward to resolve uh, these, these inter-family issues. Uh, we have coordinated with the filing district court documents in appellate district court jurisdictions around our, our area. And we're working uh, with the different uh, state court systems, uh, the state uh, child support system, and combined, uh, we've recovered a little over a million dollars this year uh, to, those, to those kids, to those families. So I think that is a huge uh, benefit. Uh, I wish I could say that I'm the one doing it, but I'm not it. Uh, one of my deputy marshals, uh, Josh Smith, uh, kind of took it under his wing and has him and a couple of other people at the, the office have really made it their own. Uh, uh, the chief uh, gave uh, Josh an award at the employee's uh, lunch we had you know, out there on the lawn. And that's why he received that was the efforts he's done with uh, child support. So I just want to bring that out. It's not in your report. I'll have it in the report for next month, but I just thought that was some really good news. Usually I try to, you know, usually I just bring you bad news, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I can bring you some good too. So. Other than that, is there any questions? Any questions for Marshall Shannon Buell? Yes, Councillor Warner. No. Okay, Shaw. Councillor Shaw. Yes. Oh. Tell us, can you share about the security that you could have this weekend for the holiday? Oh, yes. Uh, we'll have marshals at all the events, of course. Uh, our security will be doing most of the money uh, handling. Uh, we always have a large presence at the powwow. Our emergency management team, we've activated that as, a, as an ICS incident, uh, 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 incident management team. To go out, uh, they'll have their mobile command vehicle at the powwow, and then we'll do operations out of that facility to all the other outlying. Uh, we have uh, a marshal that goes down to Stokes. Uh, that's our religious ceremony that we have every year as the tribe. And uh, uh, for the last probably nine or ten years, the same marshal has volunteered to stay there at night 
Uh, it's LD dry water. Uh, a lot of you probably know him. Uh, as, as you very well know, some of the re religious ceremonies we have, uh, we should keep the same people there because they know what to expect. They know what's going on. They know the protocols to, to look at. And that's why we try to keep that consistent. Uh, we generally always, uh, our brand new marshal will assign to LD to go down to Stokes. So like this year you'll have LD and you have a new face because we want that new face to see that side of our tribe and to see kind of what's going on there. So we'll have that. Uh, we'll always have marshals at the softball fields. Uh, they'll be patrolling through Heritage Center <coughs> downtown. Uh, you'll see a very large presence of marshals at the State of the Nation. We always have it. Uh, this year you'll see in the parade uh, our emergency management team, the, the search and rescue team that we have under emergency management. Uh, was awarded a very large vehicle. It's a big uh, Ford F450 or 550, I don't know which, but it's too tall for me to climb into. And they use them for a brush truck in the fire service, but we had it built for search and rescue. So it's not bulletproof, it's none of that. It is specifically designed to help us, uh, like at Houston where you have high water, and how do I get teams to a flooded area? This is one of those vehicles, but we're putting it in the uh, in the parade Saturday. Uh, it was fully funded by a, a grant that uh, Suzanne Drywater wrote. So we're very proud of that piece of equipment and we'll have that in the parade, so. Thank you for sharing that, Shannon. Mm -hmm. You, Councilor Walker, sit. Thank you, Speaker. Hey, right. Shannon, what's the number of marshals you said we had uh, last week? You said we have 33 to include me. And then how many is on patrol? Uh, we average around 18 on patrol. 18 on patrol. Mm -hmm. So we, you guys will have enough for the weekend? Oh, yeah. We bring investigations in for the weekend. We bring, uh, we have two guys uh, on task forces, uh, one on U.S. Marshals Task Force, one on FBI Task Force. They'll be here uh, working. Uh, so we, it's, it's almost uh, uh, all hands for the, the holiday weekend. Uh, some of my staff take off. Uh, Monday and Tuesday of this week just uh, to be able to work through the weekend. Okay. Also, I want to commend you and your staff. The uh, I know Sequoia High School and uh, Tahlequah Heritage School had a lockdown. <coughs> to, uh, a robbery uh, or something took place there at Casey's. And, uh, so um, I was talking to Superintendent Leroy Qualls and uh, he was really commending senior all's praises as well. And they felt like Sequoia School, Schools was a safe place. Uh, while this is going on, and so I just want to commend you guys and well, support you. staff for keeping our students safe. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. <coughs> Councilor Shemba. Um, uh, Shan, I'd also like to say thank you. For, uh, you do it every year, but you know we ask you to send uh, your marshals up for cruise night in Jay, and mm -hmm. our population doubles, and it's a madhouse. <laughs> uh, I just want to say thank you again for your for your support and your help by sending people out. We greatly appreciate it. Well, we, we like our, our partnerships in the community. Uh, we really like them when they're on council. I'm just joking. But, <laughs> but we, we like our, you know, we, 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 we absolutely love our partners in the community. We absolutely love it. Uh, they do a lot for us in the community. If we can't be in that community at a certain time because of where we're at, it allows a bigger presence of the, uh, the marshal service. So anytime we can help our or uh, brother and sister agencies out there. We, we really try to do that. So, thank you. Okay. Yes, Anybody else? Yes, Councilor Austin. Uh, in highlight number six on your report, facilities, you have a uh, Climbmore Hastings Red Bar Three Rivers. Climbmore is always zero because you can't go on the facility. Yes. So why is it on the report? I like to bring that up every time I can. <laughs> I just, uh, I don't see any point in getting on the report. You know, I, I wish that, I'm, I'm hoping one day I'll be able to have a number on there. Okay. Uh, but right now we don't. Uh, if the council would like for me to take that off, I, I'm more than happy to, but uh, I'm, I, we constantly look for a fix for Clamore Indian Hospital. So you believe it remaining on there serves purposes. I like it on there because it reminds me every month that I need to make those phone calls and talk to people and see what's going on. I don't want to forget it. How's that? Thank you. Are you good? <clears throat> do we have cross deputization there in every county? Yes, we do. Okay, so we're good. Yes. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Good report. Thank you. 
We have the uh, Office of the Attorney General, Chrissy Nemo. Good afternoon. Just a few things to mention. Um, two, I believe it was two weeks ago, the AG's office co-hosted a meeting of uh, U.S. attorneys. Um, Trent Shore, who's the U.S. attorney for the Northern District, is the head of a committee within the Department of Justice that are the U.S. attorneys made up of, that, that have Indian country in their jurisdiction. And I believe there were about 40 of them that traveled to Oklahoma for three days of training and meetings. And they all came down and toured the Heritage Center and they used our courtroom to do some um, educational presentations. But um, again, they were all U.S. attorneys who had Indian country and the comments that we kept hearing over and over was how impressed they were about the relationships between the Northern and Eastern District U.S. Attorney's Office and the Cherokee Nation. Um, our uh, prosecutors, our law enforcement, um, the, the chief, and um, so it was, it was very nice to hear that we're kind of an example across the country for how tribes interact with um, federal law enforcement and federal prosecutors in their area, and they were all very impressed with us, so that was a neat thing to be a part of. Um, we are actively working on an amicus brief in the Murphy case. Um, the um, Mr. Murphy's uh, attorneys in that case, and that's the death penalty case, Creek Nation Reservation, um, they just got an extension on their brief. So their brief is now due September 19th, which will make our amicus brief due September 24th. Um, we are working with um, Susan Work, who I think many of you know. She used to um, work in the AG's office, and she is um, probably the most knowledgeable person alive about the history, the legal history of the five tribes in Oklahoma. And she's the lead draft on our brief, working with our office on that. But we will have additional um, historians, law professors, and folks like that will sign on to that brief. And once it's finalized, I'll be sure and share it because it's it's just fascinating. We are focusing on the historic criminal jurisdiction after Oklahoma became a state and what they did with cases that would have been in federal court or would have been in tribal court or state court and territories and it's it's a fascinating read um, about what the court said versus what really happened um, and, and who followed those court rulings and that type of thing but it's still work in progress and we will we will share that um, we uh, ball and dice became effective and started. I'm sure that you all saw that, so we were happy to, to see that. Um, we also, within the next couple of weeks, there will be a survey. Um, there will be phone calls and um, mail that the Attorney General's Office initiated. Most of the questions are about health care, um, where you receive services, whether or not you have insurance. Um, the purpose of that survey is for some of our pending and possible future litigation. So if you all get um, the calls or postcard yourself or get questions about that and it clearly identifies that it's from the Attorney General's office <coughs> that um, the information will not be used or sold to any third party um, and it's really for information gathering for us to use when we try to talk about damages and that type of thing in some of our cases so if you have any questions about that um, and we are hiring a new attorney in our office so if anyone knows any Cherokee attorneys tell them to they have to go online and apply they cannot just email us their resume we have an online application and as far as attorneys I would like to say um, briefly I know you all are um, considering a Supreme Court nomination today and I recently met Miss Baker and got to spend some time with her and um, she's super smart which is and should be the, the number one qualification to be a Supreme Court nominee. Um, I'm very happy that Chief Baker has appointed another female Cherokee attorney. There aren't very many of us out there, so we need to, we need to stick together when they can. And I've, I, I've just met Shauna and got to spend a little bit of time with her, but um, I highly recommend her approval for nomination to the Supreme Court as someone who often is in front of the Supreme Court and practices in front of them. So thank you, and I'll take any questions. <clears throat> yes, Councilor Taylor. I have a couple. Um, did you happen to visit with the U.S. Attorney? It is my understanding that it is a U.S. Attorney that is at the root of this whole issue with Plummer Indian Hospital being a federal enclave. Um, has, has that conversation ever happened with our Attorney General's office and the U.S. Attorneys? Yes. Um, okay. Well, not 
the person not in the role as a U.S. attorney, but the current U.S. attorney in the Northern District was an assistant U.S. attorney um, for many years in the Northern District, and we've had conversations with them. We have memos back and forth about the legal aspect of that. Um, and so the, the answer is yes, we have visited about it. Um, it's definitely something that, you know, we can talk to Shannon with, and if we want to push forward on that again, um, we, can, we can take another run at it. I guess my question is, um, any U.S. post office sh should have the same protections, and yet the hospital is different somehow. They it is It is different than a, um, it's somewhat different than other federal facilities. The issue is that post offices are not, but other federal facilities that are, you know, Social Security, um, some of those types, they actually hire and pay out of their budget for on-site armed security, and Claremore does not do that. Um, so you get a lot of finger pointing from people about who should be paying for that, providing it, making sure it's there. Um, and I don't, I don't know that it's completely accurate that the U.S. Attorney's Office is the root ca cause of that um, because different groups say our hands are tied for this reason and they um, and I don't think it's that anyone doesn't want um, law enforcement coverage there I think it really is an issue of everyone kind of feels like in their role their hands are tied um, and there's not much that they can do about it so well there there's got to be a solution and and you know a lot of those are my constituents, and it, it just, um, it, it's a problem. It really is. Well, I do know that we have not had, and I can't speak for the marshal, but our office has not had an in-depth conversation about it with the U.S. Attorney in the Northern District since he has become the U.S. Attorney um, before he was an assistant U.S. Attorney there, and he, you know, he, there may be some, some things now, and we will follow up on that. Okay, I appreciate that. And then I wanted to um, I w talk just a little bit about the opioid case. I understand it has been consolidated. Uh, is there any movement on that or anything you could share with us? So we um, talked about this a little bit before. They have the big MDL cases going on in Ohio where all of the opioid cases across the country were um, shipped to um, specifically those filed in federal court and then some of them filed in state court. And we have resisted that because, as we've said before, we don't want to go to trial in Ohio. We don't have any citizens in Ohio. You know, we file this in, in Sequoia County because that is the heart of the opioid ep epidemic. And if we get a jury, we want to be in, in Sequoia County. Um, we have filed motions to remand it to um, state court, and they filed objections, and we're waiting on kind of a, a final decision on that. So we have been, I guess, kind of preliminarily put in the um, multi-district litigation, but we are still attempting to get the case sent back to state court. All right. All right. That's you good? Have. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Watkins, sit. Thank you, Speaker. On the Murphy case, mm -hmm. uh, you can see we're filing a Mikas brief. Are we in uh, su support of the, of the Tenth Circuit? Yes, we are asking that the Tenth Circuit decision that found that the Creek Nation reservation had never been disestablished is affirmed by the Supreme Court. Okay, so uh, if, if the Supreme Court rules in that favor, uh, is, that, uh, is that saying that the tribes are going to have to get their own jails and their own police force and, and um, taxation changes in Oklahoma? Is that the is that the kind of following all that? Somewhat. I mean, what it what it immediately means is that within the Creek Nation, that the state does not have jurisdiction over crimes that are committed by or committed against an Indian. Um, if they're committed by a non-Indian against an Indian, only the feds will be able to prosecute that. The tribe will be able to prosecute um, Indian defendants. Um, but non-Indians, the federal court will have to try. Yes, yes. And what, well, only if their victim is Indian. If it's a non-Indian on non-Indian crime, it, the state court still has jurisdiction. Okay. Um, but, but it has to do with Native American, whether it be the victim or the... Yes, yes. And then what flows from that is, you know, somewhat speculation. And there's, there's lots of talk about what this means for the state of Oklahoma and the tribes, but... Um, the issue before the court specifically is criminal jurisdiction of 
non-Indians by the state within the Creek Nation. Um, and that's a specific issue. And, sure. you know, depending on what the court decides and how they decide it, will then determine what, you know, our arguments may be about whether or not the reservation boundaries of the Cherokee Nation have ever been this established. This could possibly jeopardize our sovereignty as well, dude, because this whole thing's about the Treaty of 1866, if we still have those, those territorial lands as tribes. So if the Senate or if the Supreme Court rules against that, then that could water down us as a tribe, or not only us, but all the tribes across the United States. Um, well, I, first of all, it's not applicable to all tribes because the, the history of the five tribes oh, and yeah, how, yeah, six, six, five tribes, right, how right. the state was created and everything else. Yeah. Um, it doesn't, it does not affect our jurisdictional boundaries. The decision will be whether or not, and it's not for us, for the Creek Nation, whether or not the outside jurisdictional boundaries still constitute outside boundaries for reservation purposes. And it's particularly important in the criminal law context because it determines who can um, who can yeah. file charges against them. Um, for civil issues, taxation, all of that, it's not as big of an issue because even if a tribe has a reservation, they still have to have, based on years of Supreme Court case law, they have to have kind of additional hooks to exercise jurisdiction over non-Indians. Um, we have jurisdiction, civil jurisdiction over Cherokees, um, whether or not we're a reservation. Um, we may or may not have civil jurisdiction over non-Indians, depending on whether we're a reservation. But if the Creek Nation is a reservation, there are still additional legal tests for them to, for example, tax or regulate a non-Indian. And um, with the exception of the Mississippi Choctaw case, where they found in Dollar General that they could sue, um, a federal court has never found that even on a reservation that a tribe has civil jurisdiction over a non-Indian. They say this is a test to determine whether or not they do, and theoretically they do, but in this case they don't. So even on reservations, tribal civil jurisdiction over non-Indians is, is very limited. I hope the Supreme Court rule in favor of the Treaty of 1866. Uh, you know, me and Councilman Shambaugh, Councilman Buzzard has been going down to North Kansas quite a bit, and uh, you know we see a, a, an issue there. You know it's Indian territory; it's our it's our, our land. On the Indians are coming in, and they're they're polluting our our properties and uh, running our Indian people out of their homes. So I hope this I hope this is a favorable ruling. This is this will be some leverage. For us to go after those people that are coming in and including those lives. I just want to be real clear. Even if even if the Creek Nation wins this case, it's good for us, but it doesn't automatically mean anything for us. We would likely have to have additional. Is it just for Creek Nation. Yes. Okay. So, yes. But, but that we could piggyback right, that. Right. Right. And yeah, this case already been. So it's down. a. And on the opposite side, just because Creek Nation loses this case doesn't mean that we lose our argument about reservation boundaries either. So whatever, and obviously we hope the Creek Nation's position prevails, but whatever decision is made, there is going to be additional litigation, I, I believe, as to the other five tribes that, will, that could last for years. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Speaker. Good. <clears throat> Councilor Shaw. Chrissy, uh, I want you to help me better understand something. Did I understand you to say that you're polling our Cherokee citizens? We're doing a survey. A um, survey. And how did you, are you making phone calls? It, are you, is it a letter writing? It is phone calls and I believe it's a postcard with where you can fill it out online. I don't think you actually send the postcard back in. I think it's, here's a website to go to to answer questions and it is um, information about um, again, most of the questions are about health care, where you see, receive your health care services, um, whether or not you have insurance, if you don't have insurance, why. Um, and even the insurance questions are, you know, there's exceptions for people who are covered by tribal health services who then don't have um, secondary insurance and that type of thing. But could, could you tell me where you got the names and addresses of our citizens that you're contacting? I believe it's census information. Um, I don't know that we have, we are, we are working with a, a third party. Um, I do not 
know the answer to that question, but I will get it and let you all know. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Good. Councillor Lake. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chrissy, you know, the, the problem that Councillor Austin and Taylor have, have brought up about Claremore and the security there at Claremore. It's been going on for a while. We had kind of, kind of a fix at one time. And then some lawyer somewhere decided that that was not proper. And, and so I assumed all this time that you guys were working on this. It doesn't sound like you kept on with it. After the citizens of the jurisdiction, including those at large, go to Claremore, I'm talking about nine counselors here. Half of our people utilize Claremore. Now, if the administration is not working on that problem, and it is a problem, we've been lucky for a long time. And if y'all aren't working on it, I mean, who's supposed to work on this? Is it you? Is it? Well, it will be us now. Brand? Again, I, I don't want to, I, I don't think that to say someone's not working on it is fair because I, you know, I listened to what Marshall Buell just said about it, and I believe that he has been on it. We were um, involved at one period of time. There was a memo. I think that we wrote that was shared with council. Um, I don't, I don't know who else is working on it, but we will now. And I mean, I we have not been actively well, you know, involved this, in this. This comes up every now and then, and it gets frustrating. And and so I'm frustrated again. And so whoever's supposed to be working on this problem, and it is a problem, needs to tell us what they're doing. Because this federal enclave thing, and I've looked it up, and I've asked a lot of people about it. It's kind of like a military base, but it's not. And it's kind of like almost between a cross between a military base and, and excuse me, trust, but it's not. It's not a lot of things. It, it is something that's very difficult to understand. And so it's a federal issue that has to be resolved through them. It can't be resolved by us here in this room. And you know that, but, but I'm, I'm not telling any, you anything you don't know, but somebody needs to go to wherever the deci decisions are made in that area and change that status. Uh, if they want to take it out of that federal enclave status, if, that, if that's a federal <coughs> issue, then Inhofe and all those guys need to help us. Uh, if it's not, if it's somewhere else, if it's in the military, then somebody needs to go to wherever that group is and tell them what our problem is. Uh, this stuff about, we ask about it, and somebody says, well, we're kind of working on it. That's not cutting it anymore. We need to, I, I want a definitive person and body. Somebody name me, tell me who's working on it. I appreciate that. Well, I can't tell you that I can fix it, but I will tell you well, I, what I, needs I to be done to fix it. Here by yourself, I know that. But tell us who's working on it. Whose responsibility is that? <coughs> if it has to be this council, then speaker needs to assign Janice and Keith to go up there and take care of it. And, and so that, somebody <laughs> needs to get on it. What I can promise you is that we will let you know exactly what has to be done and who has to do it in order for our marshals to be able to provide service there. Well, and We've got to understand the concept of federal enclave first, and it took me a long time to get that figured out. And, and that's the first thing. That has to be changed. Otherwise, some lawyer in, in the Attorney General's office in D.C. is going to say, no, you can't do that. We can't have uh, the marshal service there. We can't have the sheriff there. Although I'm probably pretty certain that if something really heavy went down there, I think those guys are going to go take care of it and we'll say mea culpa later. But that's not the way to, to do this business. I'd appreciate it if somebody could get on that. Thank we you. will. And we will provide you all, um, and we'll try to make it as non legal and technical as possible, but we will provide to you all a memo um, with the explanation of what federal enclave is and who currently has jurisdiction and what has to change. Um, in well, order for us to, to do call it. somebody from Tulsa or Oklahoma City to come and help us? How long is that going to take? Too if long. you can find them at their desk. And, and that's what it is. 
You have to call a federal officer to come to that facility. Thank you. <clears throat> Chrissy, at one time, we had Marshall McMillan stationed there. And, and it worked. <clears throat> and we had an agreement in place. And since it's an IHS facility, and we have about, what, 17 tribes represented there? It seemed like with the leverage of those 17 tribes, you could get a, maybe a federal, maybe Bureau of Indian Affairs enforcement there. And it seemed like that would be the, the you know, one option. And it's what Councilor Lay and the other council members are, are saying is, why don't we uh, take, the, take the position, we be assertive in this, in this dilemma, and we propose something and go to the table and say, when can we meet? Let's talk about this. This is the issue that we need to address before <coughs> something uh, bad happens and then we're gonna be reacting mode there. So that's just a thought. It worked one time. I don't know who gave the, the opinion that it, it's, that it wasn't legal or whoever gave that opinion, but it worked when we had Marshall McMillan up there. And I, I know there are multiple options in that if certain cross commissions are approved, then it can be local or tribal officers. If they fund a position within IHS, they can have a um, federal security officer that way. So they're, what, what I am committing to do to you all is laying out the issue and showing you what the options are available and, you know, we can make some recommendations on, on what the step is to fix it or multiple steps. Good. Get, come back with some uh, <coughs> options and if it's a funding issue, then we can resolve it here. Councilor Shamba. Um, I don't know if my question's pertinent anymore. Uh, you said you were going to send some things out. I'm new. I didn't even know this was like this, that we couldn't apparently go into. Can you give me just like a really quick reason why? I mean, the, or is, this, is it too long? Yes, no, I can give you a really quick reason. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> Claremore Indian Hospital, the land that it sets on is not trust land um, like Hastings is. It is a federal enclave, and they have specific... <coughs> rules so it's federal property so the state doesn't have jurisdiction there because it's federal property um, even though it's a tribal facility the tribe doesn't have jurisdiction there because it's a federal property um, oftentimes when the states and tribes have this issue they sign cross deputization agreements um, there are I actually don't I think they're commissions instead of cross steps and Marshall Buell would know more specifically about this but for whatever reason we do not have and or cannot get I don't I don't know if it's if we can't get them or not, but our officers and state, local, county officers are not cross step there, so they don't have authority to go onto that property and make an arrest. Well, I don't know um, what the difference is, but um, you know, we have a veteran center in, in Jay, and uh, I have a cooperative agreement with uh, the government that my department will take care of problems there until unless until. A federal person can come you know we will keep the peace we will take care of whatever happens there but <coughs> I, I sign a cooperative agreement every year uh, for that that's the agreement we had at Claremore temporarily we don't have it anymore that's kind of but that I don't, I don't know if it's the same uh, thing as the VA is that it's it's government <coughs> I mean it's federal I don't know if it's federal property but you know as far as post offices go you know it's different but you know normally post offices rent the building Anything that happens inside the post office is federal. Anything that happens out in the parking lot is uh, whatever jurisdiction where it lies because their jurisdiction does not lay in the parking lot just inside the building. Is this the same way or is this whole property considered that way? I believe it's, well, I don't know what the survey of the property looks like, but I believe it, it's inside and outside. Um, I, I know when, you know, when we pick up children there and the, the state, when we have, there's like a line that you cross and say, okay, now we have jurisdiction here and now they don't and those type of things. But um, the, the other issue is that, again, it's, you have other federal facilities, not necessarily healthcare facilities, and I don't know how the VA works. I assume there's armed security on staff at the VA hospital in Muskogee, you know. Um, but other big, especially like office buildings and that type of things, are federal facilities, courthouses. They have, they hire. I mean, they're they're federal employees that are, you know, oftentimes retired law enforcement who are armed on 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 site. And um, Claremore doesn't have that. I think there are budgetary reasons for it. Um, there may or may not be other reasons. Well, at the least. Um if there was, I guess you would say a quick fix. I mean, 
I find it very hard to believe that nobody can go on that property and do anything. And I think the problem with that is if we know that's an issue um, and something happens and we know about this issue uh, for liability purposes, I mean, we need to find somebody who has jurisdiction to be able to go in and do things. I mean, to say that we don't, that nobody has jurisdiction to go there, I think is, is dangerous. Well, I'm not saying nobody because the FBI, U.S. Marshal, U.S. Attorney's sure, Office, but they're, about, they're not there. Well, I understand. Right. And I deal with this too because, you know, at, hey, or at uh, the J Clinic, if, if uh, we call a marshal and the marshal's at uh, wherever they're at, let's say they're here most of the time or, or somewhere by here, uh, they have to drive to J, which is 45 minutes. So 45 minutes is 500 lifetimes if you need help. Five minutes is a lifetime if you need help. And that's my whole point is, you know, to be able to have somebody to be there in uh, a time that is considered appropriate for a first responder or a, or a police officer to, to respond to a facility. That, I think that would be very important to, to find somebody who could who, you know, we would know for sure that if we have a problem at one of our clinics, that somebody could respond in an appropriate time to take care of that problem. I mean, that's, I think that's a major liability issue if we don't. That's just my opinion. So you get back with us and I make will. some recommendations. Mm -hmm. Putting it at okay. the top of my list. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Taylor, you still have a question or are you good? Uh, I just want to... Keith, wasn't there something about the year that that property was put into service or something like that? Isn't there, isn't there something weird about the title to that property? Do you not remember any of this? I, I don't remember the detail well enough to, to speak okay. of it. There is some idiosyncrasy about that yeah. property. Okay. And I'm sure Chrissy will know that the next time she comes in. I don't know it now, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Good report. Okay. Gwen Terpin. This will be short and sweet again. We've only got um, 11 for this year. We had one new FOIA request, so we've got nine there and one new GRA, and the FOIA and the GRA are both outstanding at this time. And we've updated the website, and all of you should have gotten a copy of my report. Okay. Any questions for Gwen? Not? Good report. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, we have Tax Commission Sharon Swepson. Lady in red. Good afternoon. I believe you have my report. I'll try to address any questions that you might have. Yes, Councilor Walmsley. I have not really a question, but it's a comment. I, I went to get my car tag uh, the other day, and, and it was uh, it's really a fast and simple process with the technology you guys have. and. Um, I was kind of hoping we had something similar like that into, or maybe our healthcare. Uh, I like where they, they, they call your name automatically, I guess, through the uh, mm -hmm. computer generated. Right. Uh, where that little technology you got there, but right. it, it's, it's a smooth system you guys got. It, it seems to really help a lot. And the, the only issue we have with that system is it gives an estimate based on the number in front of you. But the computer can't say these are renewals; these are going to take less. So sometimes the time, and it says up there, it's an estimate. Yeah, and so minutes. some people will walk away and go outside, and yeah. then their name gets called. We call it three times, and then they have to sign back in. And that's really the only issue that we are having. We are looking, especially at Telequal right now. I bought um, like an intercom system, so it will, so they can hear it outside. Okay, so you. we're hoping that's going to resolve that issue and if it works there we're going to try it at the Katusa office because that one's so small a lot of people are out in the lobby of the uh, tourist area there uh, the tourism and outside and so we're hoping that will help with those two with people hearing their names and being able to come in and stop some of that unhappiness so yeah, I'm telling you you guys have came a long ways and uh, there's a lot of happy people in there now customers and your staff so you guys are doing a great job I appreciate that so, thank you thanks speak anybody else Councilor Austin yeah the uh, uh, I'm sure that I'm not the only one in this room because uh, I'm quite certain uh, Councilor Anglin's hearing these same things but Catusa and Collinsville are getting uh, slammed I know uh, with the um, at-large 
tags. There are the two offices that are accessible to folks. Uh, I know we just took, spoke about this in the last meeting, yeah. but this issue is not going to go away. Yeah. And unless there's a real plan to deal with it, uh, I, I don't know. We're just going to tell people, we sorry, but uh, we've taken care of everybody we can for this year or something. Exactly. Uh, people and are going and getting very frustrated. I know they are. And I've dealt with two or three customers just the first part of this week over that. Because Friday, for whatever reason, we were bombarded at the Catoosa office. I think when they quit taking people at 415, they still had 30 something people left there. There's no way they could have processed them and still been able to do reports and get to the bank and, and do everything that they have to do. Plus the staff's got kids they have to pick up, you know, and things like that. So they, they try to help all they can. I have had a staff member to go up. We are looking to see if there's a possibility of adding at least one more person to Catoosa. And then I have visited with the lady over um, the tourism side, and she's getting with, I believe it's Miss Jarvis up there, and we're gonna try to sit down and see if we have any other options of being able to expand that office or do something different. So it's just it's just grown more than what there, the space There needs will to be handle. either more, more windows, right. more people, or there needs to be an additional office someplace that services that population. I think the answer would be to a larger office with more staff in it um, to be able to handle that. So I, I think that that's going to be our answer to the Catoosa issue. Now, based on the fact that this is not, this is a service to where it creates, it's an income producing service. Yes, sir. Uh, so it's in our best interest to take care of these folks. Uh, I would think that we'd be able to come up with a plan pretty quickly that says, this is a good business model. We can make this happen. Right. And, uh, and get, get that thing happening. Right. And that's, like I said, I've, I've met with the lady there. I talked with her after we had our last meeting and she's going to get with Miss Jarvis and they're going to get me back hopefully this next week, some areas, some different properties that we have that are there that could possibly work for, okay. for the tax commission. So we're hoping we can get something started pretty quick. I mean, I hate to do an expansion of a window if that's really not going to fix the problem because I'm not sure that one person is going to fix that issue up there because it has grown so much. But I hate to overdo it too because your busiest times are going to be holidays, first part of the month and end of the month, and then in the middle it slows down, but you still got to take care of business all month long. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Don't we do an orientation for anybody that wants to become Cherokee that, you know, sometimes you have to be patient and stay in line? <laughs> Is that oh, somewhere shit. in our handbook anywhere? <laughs> no. Anybody else? We have it too easy. Cherokees aren't used to standing in line. <laughs> Unless it's for oh, donated food huh. or something like that. Clothing we line. try to not make them stand in line too long. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Good report, Shannon. Okay. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you. Tax commission's good. I see our good buddy Jamie Hummingbird back there. Give us some good news, Jamie. <laughs> it's all good news. How's everybody on this fine summer day? Good. Really good so far. Well, just uh, start off with the bang. Uh, as uh, Chrissy mentioned a little bit earlier, the Balls and Dice did uh, get introduced for live play last Monday. I uh, have not seen any of the results yet, but upon hearing, it's very well received. Uh, the uh, Hard Rock was the first market in the Tulsa area. Uh, we were not first in the state, but uh, first in the Tulsa market and then made a big splash there. So we were very glad to see that happen. And approximately uh, 13 tribes were approved on the same day as we were on the, the uh, 17th of August, and several have been added since that time. So uh, everything seems to be going pretty well, so, <coughs> so not going well. Uh, the uh, FY18 external audit for the casinos has uh, kicked off. Actually, we are in the process of uh, doing the uh, review for the internal control standards that are being used out of the casinos. It's probably the more, um, or actually the less onerous of all of the uh, audits that are going to be done. Uh, the engagement letters for the actual audit and the uh, agreed upon procedures for the state compact were just sent to my office this week. We'll be getting those back over to BKD so that they can start their full-fledged audit come 1 October. 
So we'll be ready to get that done. The audit itself has to be done within 120 days of fiscal year end. So we have to have it into the NIGC by the 28th of January every year. And then we have to have it into the state uh, at least by February 28th. But since we already have it for the NIGC, we give it to the state at the same time. So we definitely meet our reporting requirement for the compact. Uh, the last three things are very fast, very quick. Uh, the NTGCR, uh, the National Tribal Gaming Commissioners and Regulators Association is having its fall conference September 18th through the 20th at Mystic Lake, which is just outside of Minneapolis. If you'd like to attend, let me know. Uh, we can uh, get you schooled and more than you ever wanted to know about gaming regulation. Uh, the NIGC is actually having a 30 years of IGRA uh, meeting in D.C. on October the 16th. Uh, to commer commemorate, obviously, the 30 years since IGRA was passed in 1988. Uh, the uh, event is uh, going to be uh, one to uh, uh, showcase what has happened and what tribes have been able to accomplish since the passage of IGRA in the state of uh, Indian gaming as it is today. So ought to be a good meeting. And lastly, um, I wanted to uh, let the uh, committee know that uh, in the years past, one, one of the things I've taken pride on is the, uh, the, the quality and the caliber of my staff. And I always try to take uh, a moment to recognize my staff wherever I can. So <clears throat> given that I have a microphone and you're a captive audience, I'm going to tell you about one of my staff members. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gina Cavanis is my current compliance manager. Uh, I'm going to be losing Gina here in a couple of weeks. She has uh, been hired away by the NIGC and she represents my fourth person I've lost to the NIGC. So I get good people, I get them trained up, and then NIGC poaches them. I haven't forgiven them for that. I've already told them that, so they can probably watch it on video now. So, uh, But I wanted to uh, okay. let the uh, committee know uh, that we, we have a good person with uh, Gina, who is a tribal member, and I wanted to let you guys know that, and everybody else that may be watching, that uh, we have a good person with Gina, and. Uh, going to be sad to see her go so sure uh, other than that you know, I, it, it doesn't bother me when we lose them to NIGC long it's not to an opposing competitive tribe nearby <laughs> uh, we don't forgive them for that but NIGC we're good I've always told my staff if they ever leave that I hope it's for something bigger and better and I know this is going to be bigger and better for her and her family uh, I don't want to see her go but I'm happy for her absolutely yes council Shaw yes Jamie uh, you said we've lost four employees yes. in the NIGC. Is that what is it that they're offering that we're not? <laughs> is it the salary? Is are we competitive? It is. In it our is salary? salary, and it is something that uh, I cannot compete with. It is. Uh, it's just that much of a difference. How different? Uh, just for future references in budget planning, what exactly would you need in salary? I mean, a percentage increase, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, not we sure. should know this. Well, salary is a small <laughs> part of it. We're losing some of our best people. Yeah, itself. but salary is a small part of it. To, to the experience working for NIGC yeah. and to oversee all the gaming of all the tribe, that's a wonderful opportunity. Sure it is. And they can always come back to the tribe. And my door will always be open. Uh, but it, it, it is something that is substantial. Uh, and it, 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 it doesn't come with a small price tag. Thank you. Uh -huh. No. All right, Councillor uh, Eo, you haven't said much today. Go ahead. Are all the tables going It's going to be going, the, the, the dice table and all that? I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe uh, Roland may be the only one. I know we were looking at uh, some proofs of their, the dice that they were going to be using. I'm not sure if they've gotten those in yet. I was out last week, so they may be going by now. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, both Katusa and Siloam have been operating uh, for well over a week. Um, but Roland may be the only one. Uh, I can find out for sure and let you know. I can find out. Okay. Councilor <laughs> 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 Walker. Thanks, uh, This is kind of on a, a different note, but yeah. I was uh, reading online on Indians.com. Mm -hmm. I just want to commend you and your wife for raising a wonderful daughter. Uh, going before the Senate of Indian Affairs Committee and representing the Cherokee Nation and our immersion program, speaking passionately about preserving that. Um, I, I commend you guys, and Lorna, I commend you for doing that. You made national news, and uh, we thank you for doing that. 
Yeah. Well, Who is Lauren now? Is she here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Stand up. <laughs> Up. She, she was a witness at the scene of the saw that. Yeah. And she can hit a golf ball, too. Oh, so she can oh, <laughs> Well, she can skin a bug, set a trot line, and uh, give a testimony. She can do it all. <laughs> you did good, Ms. Trump and Moore. I want to thank uh, the, uh, the council, too, for indulging my absence last week, but uh, I had a higher calling to sit, uh, sit in the gallery and support my daughter. And sure. I think um, think you would all agree if you get a chance to watch her testimony, if you haven't seen it thus far, uh, the passion that she exhibits, the intelligence that she shown in front of those committee members uh, represents a bright future for our tribe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaker, there's a, a, I guess it's the Esther Martinez Act. It's yes. uh, $13 million for the next four years for immersion programs. So, uh, for Cherokee Nation staff who is watching that for grant money, uh, just we need to be applying for that mm -hmm. for emergency school. Most definitely. Who's the chair of education committee? Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, anyways, I thank. You. Yes, Councilor. Do you want to say something, Councilor Shambo? No. Okay. Good report. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Uh, human resources, uh, Dr. Moore. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. To start with, um, last week I got the opportunity to go to a conference. It was called HR in Indian Country. It's something um, they started last year. And um, it's nice because a lot of the rules that apply generally to human resources may not apply to us. And it was a good opportunity for tribes to get together and um, go to seminars and talk with each other about systems and the way they're doing stuff. And um, I plan over the next few weeks to follow up with a few people I met and kind of go over issues they're having, kind of see if we're having the same issues or successes. I also put in your packet kind of a preliminary report of the raw data I have so far. I just want to briefly go over what this isn't. This is just my first run at it to kind of show trends, what I have, and kind of the big picture. I'm not going to have a final report um, until I talk to the departments, and I'll start doing that next month. And some of the departments are larger than others, so I may divide those into smaller areas. But basically, I've gotten this down to where even my explanation sheet is three pages long. So um, we try to get it from the time you need an employee. When you go into our system and go, I'm requisitioning, I have a vacancy, I'm doing it now, to the time the person attends orientation. And I do that because I want to see at every stage how long it takes for us to do each area because if you need to change something or tweak something, you need to kind of know what the problem is. A few years back when we started, I had the results, but I had the beginning and the end, and I really couldn't with certainty tell you what happened in between. Case in point, if you look at the first page on the top one, all the numbers seem a little high. Well, this gave me an opportunity to see what's going on with that, and um, it was kind of a mistake in the system. I somehow allowed a department to use the same requisition on three different hires over the course of this time period. So I'm like, okay, that makes sense. So it's a number I have to live with. It stays on the report. So at some point in the final phase, I'll put a little thing at the bottom to show you, hey, by the way, this was actually three separate attempts to hire for three separate positions on one requisition. I had tried to get away from doing that because um, it really doesn't let me know how long it takes me to hire someone if I use one as an open, because it could be two or three years old, and I wouldn't know how many people we've hired on it. So things like that I'm going to go through and um, I know we'll talk again about 
about this. And if you have any questions now, please let me know. Okay. Anybody having comments or questions? Councilor Watkins, stay. Uh, Morton, how long does it take for you guys to run a report to identify how many Cherokees you have working in your workplace? A day, two days? Um, it doesn't take very long. Okay. And I think that's in your monthly. Okay. Uh, what about as far as identifying um, salaried positions? Let, let, let's say you just want a report of people that make $80,000 and above on W-2 wages, it, uh, how long would that take to break down to identify those people? A day? I don't know, and that may be... Maybe a couple days? I, I'm just ballparking here. Uh, let him do the answering. Hey, I, I don't know. I can... Keith, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know. I don't know if I've run a report like that, so I can see what it would take to run one. I'm just, I'm just asking. Okay. That's all I have to speak to. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Councilor Taylor? I just have one question on this um, report you're attempting to get together for us. The date requested, the date uh, the request was approved by the department is the date the request was approved by the department, is that when that job was posted? No. No. On the first column, it will be the one called date requisition or REQ. Okay. That's the day someone in the department determined, I have a vacancy, I need to fill it, and they um, entered it in our electronic system. Then for the approvals, um, somewhere up the chain, it's normally the highest level of your department would go, yes, I agree, we have an open position, we have funding, let's move forward. So those two dates are how it tracks along within the department. And then after we have that, um, we would post soon after that. Okay. So, so there's not an actual date here that shows when a potential employee would see that online and possibly apply. But it should be shortly after. Yes. Because I don't think there's many, if any, steps after that of just loading in going, okay. here it is. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Buzz. Uh, Mason, take the second line. <clears throat> where it says basic over on the far right hand column TTF is that total total time to fill that's the because basically if you add the total candidate total post total department um, total background and total time the analyst has it those should add up to that number now, is that is that uh, total candidate is three So if you had one candidate there, it would still take 150, 152 days? That looks like it was it posted at least twice. And on the department, I'll get with them and see, see. what was happening with that number. And on background, it took 14 calendar days and then with the analyst, 16. When your post time and your analyst time is close together, <laughs> That clues me in. It had to be posted twice, and at the second time we did it, we found the candidate. So on the fourth line on the background check, two days. That was probably a non. That's probably a position that didn't require a very extensive background. Yeah. Okay. But but uh, do, do we do we do background checks on all of them? Is that right? Yes. Okay. They just. The level of background check and the time it takes it's varies on the type of position. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, sir. Good. Anybody else? Okay. Good report. Just keep us posted on the progress you're making. Thank, Thank you, you nice. very much. And the reason I do it this way is before I meet with the department, these are just my numbers. Well, it go, seems okay. I think it's uh, it's easier to understand the way you're trying to report to us now. Okay. Okay, before we, we don't have any old business, before we move on to new business, I'd like to introduce a, uh, a good friend of ours from the Eastern Bend, one of our council members, his lovely wife, 
Uh, Richard Frant, do you want to stand? The lady of Kingston Online, Ange, uh, appreciate you too. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get this uh, business over with. We, uh, I see our good buddy John Payton coming in here. Uh, Councillor Taylor, you want to take the next one? I was really distracted. <laughs> this is a resolution electing the office of Secretary of the Tribal Council. I move for its approval. Got a motion. And uh, it comes to us blank. I'll nominate Frankie Hargis. Second. second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Let's do this by acclamation. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Frankie, got any speech or anything on that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next we have uh, EO. You want to take the next one? You want to come forward? They can if they want to. We'll go ahead and read it first. I was trying to keep you back there. EO called you to the phone. <laughs> go ahead, EO. I got a resolution confirming the reappointment of James Simmons as a commissioner of the Housing Authority of the Cherokee Nation. Board of Commissioners. I'll second. Second. Motion motion. And second. All in favor, signify. I'd like to be added as a, I'd like like to be added as a sponsor to that. Okay. Did you get that, Shelley? Anybody else want to be added? Just raise your hand. Councilor Walking Stick, Anglin, Vasquez, Shambaugh. Look like everybody. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Any words of wisdom? Well, I'd just like to thank you for your confidence in me and I will continue to do the best job I know how. If there's anything we need to do, please let us know. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Okay, have uh, resolution number three here. Councilor Jordan, you want to take that? Yes. This is a resolution confirming the appointment of Diane Mayfield as a commissioner of the Housing Authority of the Cherokee Nation Board of Commissioners, and I put that in the form of a motion. Second. Got a motion and a second. Okay, uh, we've got sponsors here. Uh, raise your hand. Okay, look like we've got everybody again. So, uh, uh, those of you who have not met uh, Diane, she's a person of good character, used to work for the tribe uh, some time ago, and uh, her uh, late husband was a uh, commissioner on the Housing Authority. So, uh, not have any questions, we'll vote on it. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Unless you've got something to say, you're you're good. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thank you, okay. All right. Uh, last we've got uh, resolution number four. Uh, Councilor Vasquez. Yes, sir. Um, I move to approve the nomination of Shauna Baker as Justice of the Cherokee Nation Supreme Court. I'd like to make a statement, a short one that Ms. Baker has impeccable credentials for this position. She has a law degree and advanced degrees and an impress impressive professional resume. She adds diversity to our Supreme Court too by being a woman and uh, for the, as an at-large counselor, which I believe we definitely need. Um, we need some uh, diversity. And also she has litigated cases and tackled complex legal matters, matters and she's been a law professor and written professional articles. Mr. Chairman, I gladly support this nominee. Okay, got a motion? Second. Second. Any more discussion? I'd just like to say Questions? she's from Adair County. Adair County. County. Okay, <laughs> Councilor Anglin? Yes, thank you, Speaker. Uh, Ms. Baker, are you related to anybody in the AG's office or anywhere in the Cherokee Nation? No, Councillor England. Uh, and if I may, I'd like to expand a little bit more and also make an opening statement. Uh, I, I am not related to Chief Baker. Uh, my Bakers are from the Catoosa area. And to my knowledge, I'm not related to anyone that is employed by the Cherokee Nation in any facility, whether it be here in Tahlequah or whether it be through Cherokee Nation businesses of any kind. So. Um, first, I want to uh, thank Mr. Speaker, also uh, Deputy Speaker Vasquez, and also all members of the Tribal Council. I appreciate your time today. Uh, I want to thank Councilor Austin for coming to visit me in my office in Tulsa and taking time out of his schedule to do so. Um, I was very grateful for your kindness and, and our enlightening conversation. 
this morning, uh, uh, late last night actually, uh, Counselor Lay reached out to me by email and I'm also grateful for uh, his questions and for the compliments that he gave me. Uh, I want to once again in this moment extend my gratitude to Chief Baker uh, for nominating me to this position uh, on the Supreme Court. I'm deeply humbled to have been chosen. And I know that we are gathered here today under um, sorrowful, sorrowful circumstances um, at the passing of Justice Angela Barker Jones. And so to you as tribal council members, uh, to the citizens of the Cherokee Nation, to her friends and her family, I wish to extend my heartfelt condolences and, and let each and every one of you know that you're in my thoughts and my prayers. It is because of Justice Barker Jones and former Justice Stacey Leeds leadership that women can see themselves sitting on the highest court of the Cherokee Nation. And I, along with many other female members of our tribe, will forever be indebted to them for, for paving the way and inspiring future generations of women jurists. I am, as many of you know, and as my introduction uh, stated, an at-large member of the Cherokee Nation currently residing in Tulsa. Uh, from birth until approximately the age of four, I did live in Catoosa. Uh, and shortly thereafter, um, my mother and father divorced, and my mother remarried a gentleman from Adair County, and so we moved to the Piney community, which is just a little east of Barron, for those of you who know it, and uh, I attended Westfield Public Schools K-12. through And from a very early age, I excelled at learning, and I went on to become valedictorian in my high school class. From there, I've received numerous accolades over the course of my academic career. I was the first person on both my mother and my father's side of the family to attend college. And today, as I sit here before you with three law degrees and 16 years of legal experience and also a master's degree in biology, I bring to the court a very unique background. Not only am I a litigator, but I'm also a scholar, and I have strength of experience in matters of taxation, probate, estate planning, employment law, and other matters that impact businesses. I'm very proud of my Cherokee Nation citizenship and of the Cherokee Nation's support during the early and pivotal years of my life. Whether it was vis visiting the Johnson O'Malley office for extra paper, pencils, and other school supplies at a moment's notice, or perhaps it was racing my sister down the driveway of our poultry farm to carve off a large slice of commodity cheese for our afternoon snack following our bus ride home, Cherokee language instructors inspiring me with their visits to my elementary classrooms, receiving assistance with the purchase of athletic shoes, learning the arts of basketry and beadwork, and or scholarships that I received every semester of my undergraduate education, the Cherokee Nation provided for me at a time when I was unable to provide for myself, and it also enriched my understanding of my Cherokee culture. The history of our tribe, particularly our removal and relocation, deeply influenced my values and instilled in me the lessons such as that no matter what difficulties we may face, they can always be overcome with perseverance. Of greatest importance, I believe our matriarchal heritage empowered me and shaped my outlook in life to see myself as equal to my male counterparts from an early age. Only after moving outside the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation did I truly appreciate what a privilege it was to come of age in the tribe's care. To serve the citizens of the Cherokee Nation as a Supreme Court Justice would be a dream come true, not because I ever imagined myself to be sitting before you in this very moment, but because I yearn to give back and to give to my tribe. Throughout my adult life, I've made it a practice to serve my communities, whether it be here in Oklahoma or in Jacksonville, Florida. And I'm given back because I'm aware of the difference that the Cherokee Nation made in my life. I've had the privilege of serving on several boards here in Oklahoma, including the Tulsa Girls Art School and also the Community Food Bank, as well as participating in a number of leadership organizations, including Leadership Tulsa. And I'm hopeful that today that you will not only see my legal qualifications, but that you will also see my servant's heart. Ultimately, I believe that both are important for a Cherokee Nation Supreme Court nominee. If confirmed, I will forever be mindful that the controversies coming before the court are seeking final resolution, and that I've been entrusted to uphold the Cherokee Nation Constitution to protect our sovereignty, our culture, our prosperity, and our freedom. I will approach each case with due care, and in ruling, I will strive to issue decisions only on the questions presented and not on the questions that have gone unasked. I will review with vigilance the specific facts of the cases that have been presented along with the evidence, and I will also listen for understanding in oral arguments. 
Furthermore, I pledge to consider each case impartially in accordance with the laws of the Cherokee Nation and to always respect the limits of the court. So thank you once again, Mr. Speaker, for this time, Deputy Speaker Vasquez and members of the <coughs> Council, and I'm open for additional questions. Any questions? Am I right here? Anybody? Left. Councilor Walker, Thanks, Speaker. Uh, Mr. Baker, yes, I appreciate your Tom come up here and a uh, uh, well-written speech and uh, from the heart. Um, you have a really uh, impressive resume. Uh, you went to some very prestigious uh, law schools and I see your, uh, all the work you do in the communities, uh, very impressive. Uh, first, I'd like to ask you some, a few questions. Uh, how many years have you been practicing law? I was admitted to the bar in 2002, so I've been practicing 16 years. Okay. In the uh, 16 years, uh, how many cases have you filed over the 16 years? Honestly, I, I could not count them. I'm sorry. I've, I've not taken a, uh, a poll. Okay. Uh, out of all of the cases that you've uh, that you filed, what would you say the majority of them that you, spe that you specialize in? The majority of cases that I've specialized in most recently have been estate planning matters and business matters. So currently I represent a number of uh, businesses in the Tulsa area as their outside general counsel, uh, but I also help families with estate planning, succession planning, taxation planning, and so forth. So uh, it's kind of a little bit of uh, diversity there uh, for people that pass away. Okay. There are times there are probates and, and so forth. So uh, there may be a, a civil court filing for the business, but there may be a probate filing for a, a family. Okay. And out of all those cases that you filed, uh, how many of those have been tribal cases? I have not uh, participated in tribal court. Okay. Are you uh, a member of the Cherokee Bar? I have submitted my application, but I'm awaiting acceptance. Okay. Um, I guess it's you know, we got some, we got elections coming up here uh, next summer. And, uh, have you have you participated in any of our elections in the past years? Or uh, yes, sir. I uh, participated in the 2007 uh, election by absentee ballot, but I have not participated since, and I own that responsibility. Okay. Um, well, yeah. So I mean, our Supreme Court in the past, they've they've really been. Uh, involved as far as deciding the some election outcomes and especially uh, what we've seen kind of in recent years. Um, you know, um, Cherokee Nation, a lot of our Indian people uh, have seen the federal government take advantage of, of tribes. And a lot of our Indian people have exerted themselves and went to law school so they could understand the law better to protect and uphold our treaties uh, just so that the tribes wouldn't be taken advantage of by the federal government anymore. And over the last 40, 50 years, we've seen thousands and thousands of our Indian people go and assert themselves to protect our sovereignty as a tribe. And especially Cherokee, uh, our church, we have thousands of Cherokee people right now that's either in law school or they've been practicing for, uh, for many, many years. And uh, with saying that, it's, um, uh, uh, this, this position in our, our Supreme Court and us being a, a highly mature tribe, um, it's, it's, it's tough to consider someone of, of your caliber uh, f from a tribal standpoint. Uh, I, think, I think you're exceptional in, in the field of work and practicing and what you do on the day to day with you know, estate, succession planning, taxation, all that, probates. Uh, but when you go into Indian country and Indian law, there are totally two different um, branches of law. It's like a, it's like a brain surgeon going and doing heart surgery. Some of the most esteemed and uh, highly qualified attorneys in private practice don't touch Indian law due to the complexity of it. Uh, we, have, we have treaties and, and uh, laws that go back hundreds of years. And uh, for someone at this level to 
represent us at the highest level, to be sure that our sovereignty and, and, and we're defended at the highest level. Uh, you know, our, our Supreme Court is in a place where uh, you, you come and practice Indian law. It's something when you come into Cherokee Nation, it's something that you have in you're already engaged in it and you're already aware of the, the cases before they even come to you. Uh, so, anyways, speaker, with, with saying that, um, I, uh, I won't be supporting you today, and it's, it's hard, but uh, I, think, I think you're an extremely intelligent young lady, and I think you have, uh, you have over exceeded your expectations, and you are a, a success story, especially coming from Ader County. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, uh, so, anyways, for saying that, uh, I, I won't, I won't be supporting you, but I wish you the best in your future endeavors, in in, in your in your career. So, right. Mr. Thank Speaker, I know that he hasn't asked a question, but if, if I may respond, uh, nonetheless, to his narrative. Uh, and can we go ahead and get the questions finished here? Oh yes, please. Yeah, Councilor Wright. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Baker, I, I did compliment your education. Yes, thank I don't you. Know if I've seen one like that lately. Well, thank you, sir. It's really, it's really great to see a Cherokee citizen go through all, all that education. I value education. There's a lot of, every time we have an educational issue here, these guys can tell you, and gals can tell you, my hand goes up. I value that because I don't have one. So I appreciate them so much. I appreciate your, your willingness to go through all of that that you had to do. Uh, a couple of the things that, that struck me, and, and you already know this, you know, from my email to yes, you, was your lack of experience in tribal and Indian law. And you did uh, offer me a, a one area that, that you did some of that. It was years ago, and it was kind of minimal. But at least you had some. And the other thing is that I tried for probably four or five days to find somebody that knew you especially Cherokee lawyers, because all lawyers that are Cherokee know each other. And it was brought home to me when Chrissy said a while ago she just met you. And, and so I, I can't support you today either, not because I don't like you, or not because I don't appreciate your education, because we have many Cherokee women lawyers, both inside and outside the jurisdiction, you have stayed in tune with the tribe much more than you have. And, and, and they've either worked for the tribe or they've been on board for the tribe or they've been on the gaming commission for the tribe and I can just keep naming those boards and so forth. And they, they've stayed in tune, they never left us. Is what I'm saying, even though they might live in Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Arkansas, Brooklyn, I don't know where they live, but they're out there. Uh, I think the chief might rethink where he's trying to place you and put you on one of our boards for a while and bring you in to us to see what, what the Cherokee people go through sometimes. There are a lot of issues that come up in the court that you would be faced with, with our Taro law that you don't know anything about, Cherokee preference that you don't know much about. You've heard it, but you don't know what it is. I know an issue that the speaker and I are talking about now about Cherokee preference uh, is going to come up here pretty quick. We're going to have to straighten it out or somebody's going to have to straighten it out. And so you would have to come up to speed on it and I'm not saying you couldn't uh, with your education and your background. I think you might. But we've had a Tayro laws for decades. I don't know how long we've had a Tayro law. It's been on the books for decades. We upgraded it in 2011 and 12. We changed it again in 2014. And it seems to me that, that something has slipped a cog in one of our business areas and we're gonna to have to go back and, and, and look at that again. And most of the folks that you'll see coming through your court will be just regular working blue collar Cherokee citizens who were either Something happened to them in the job that's not right, 
or, or something, you know, took place in another area. ICW is one of them. They start in district court, but they end up where you're wanting to go. And, and so sometimes the district gets it right, sometimes maybe not. Maybe you guys have to relook at it. And, and so it's tough. It's not an easy, easy part-time gig for 35000 a year. You know, th this is tough business. And you, you have to get it right the first time. Not the second time, the first time. And, and so I, I just don't see your experience level. I think the chief could have found another Cherokee woman lawyer who had tremendous experience with our laws and the way that our courts work. And I, I just I just don't see it in you, but I see a lot of a lot of good things in you that I'd like to see you placed on one of our boards to bring you in long enough, you know, for a few years to to get you ready for where you're going. Uh, where you're going is not going to be easy, and and you know I can't support you on it, but you, you can answer me any way you want to. If I, if you want to get after me, that's fine. No, I, no, I, I, I have no I've desire. I've had lawyers here do that for eight years now, so I'm used to it. I've, I've no desire to get after anyone. I am, uh, as many of you can see from from the resume from the time that I was uh, young uh, through my most recent degrees, I've always excelled. Uh, I've never been one to settle for mediocre. And, uh, you know, I, uh, for example, in receiving my um, most recent law degree from NYU, I would work here in Tulsa on Monday. Uh, Tuesday morning at 6 a.m., I would catch the red eye to uh, fly into New York. I would take classes on Tuesday and Wednesday and work remotely, and I would fly back on Thursdays and meet with clients on Thursday and Fridays. And I did that for two years in order to receive that degree. So, and, and still made the honor roll, uh, if you will. So, my um, uh, ability to uh, interpret the Constitution, to read up on, on uh, statutory uh, disputes that are cases that are brought before the court, for the employment law issues that are brought before the court, I firmly believe uh, to both Councilor Walking Stick and to Councilor Lay that I have the motivation, but I also have the tools. The reason that we go to law school is to learn our craft, our craft of being able to read, to interpret, to understand, to reason, to write. And that doesn't <coughs> change with respect to the specialty of the law, although I do admit that, of course, the more familiar you are with the laws when you start a process, the faster, basically, you can get up to speed. But I am committed to getting up to speed, uh, and I will do everything in my power to be there for that first meeting. Uh, furthermore, while there may be people that don't know me, and I may not have served the Cherokee Nation before, I think that brings something unique to the court. I am neutral. I am very impartial. Uh, you don't have to, from an election perspective, I'm not somebody that's necessarily an unfriendly to any camp. Uh, and that's what I believe that we are supposed to do as justices on, on any court if given that opportunity. So I believe that we are supposed to remain neutral, we are supposed to remain impartial, and we are supposed to, uh, again, uphold those duties of the laws. And, and uh, working with the law, and uh, conversing with it is something that, again, I have excelled in. I also bring a unique perspective to the court by bringing a scholarly background. So many of your uh, current jurists are, are former state district court judges, and they have many hours on the bench, but they haven't necessarily crafted uh, scholarly journals and, and uh, scholarly, scholarly articles and had them published in journals and, and other publications. And, and I think that's also important because I think the writings of the court for long-term precedents are, are incredibly valuable. Uh, you have to have somebody with a skill set in writing that is able to articulate uh, with ease and with grace uh, the meaning of the law so that it's not just legal scholars that can understand it but it's for those blue-collar workers that are coming in and having their disputes heard as well so um, I respect your positions uh, but uh, I think if given the uh, opportunity for those who may be undecided I think that uh, perhaps this time next year or perhaps even in a few months if we meet again I hope that you say to me that I've blown your socks off uh, to use a catchphrase, and, uh, and that your vote was well placed, because I promise that I will uh, not let any of you down. One, one thing that I might ask you if, if, if sure. we meet again is if I ask for your opinion of something 
please don't answer me, it depends. That's all I get out of the door. <laughs> yes, sir. So, uh, and there's one behind you that's smiling. I get one of those. <laughs> you can't ask her. And, and so, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, Councilor Shell. Hi, Ms. Beck. Hello. It's nice to meet you. I, I know we share mutual friends. Yes, ma'am. That I highly respect and regard. Uh, I want to ask you, I saw on somewhere that you were working on your master's, uh, your LLM. Did you obtain that in what end? Yes, ma'am. I actually have two masters. Um, so within a law school, many of you are familiar with a JD. That's what m lawyers receive in order to begin practicing. A law school has two additional degrees within it. An LLM is considered a, a master's level. Uh, kind of assume that the JD is like a bachelor's. And uh, there's also a, a PhD equivalent. It's called a JSD or an SJD, depending on the school. So I have two LLMs. Uh, my first was Columbia University in New York. It's an Ivy League degree. Uh, when I wanted to go into teaching, I was told that unfortunately a law school degree from the University of Tulsa uh, would never um, open the doors to the academy for me. And so I, I jokingly say that I had to go to uh, Columbia and launder my TU degree. But um, as, a, as a child coming out of uh, Adair County, out of Westville, from two parents that had never been to school before, I had no idea that there was such a thing as uh, rankings and and it's such a privilege to have achieved so much. And uh, to answer your question, I also received a second LLM from NYU, and it was in taxation in 2015. Uh, would you like a couple of minutes? Oh, no, I, I'm, it, it really is sometimes it's overwhelming to look back at where you began. And where you, you, have, you have you have accomplished a great deal in your yes. lifetime. Thank yes. you so much. Yes. Uh, getting back to this position, I would like to ask you: uh, How does a law practice, which has pretty much exclusively been in wealth management, yes, how will that translate to tribal law? Translate to tribal law as far as helping to rule on opinions. Um, I, I don't think that it necessarily translates, which I believe is actually a very good thing. Um, for me, what it means is that I will not bring any conflicts of interest. I uh, won't necessarily find that um, subject to disqualification or uh, needing to recuse myself for matters that come before the court. So I find that to be uh, important and, and actually something that's a positive in this situation. Would it be fair to say that in your experience as a litigator, you've probably litigated less than 50 cases? Uh, no, I, I don't think that is fair. I know that um, the number of cases that I, oh, thank you, that I litigated uh, while at Derner, uh, just in those number of years, I believe would have exceeded 50 cases. Uh, clearly, I was not first chair on all of them. Uh, but participated. And the reason that I say that is because I was handling a number of uh, bankruptcy cases that were called preference actions. Um, and preference actions are basically a, a very sad uh, cases approximately um, six months uh, before the debtor files bankruptcy. Every uh, creditor that they paid uh, must be basically visited and asked to return their monies that, that, that they've received and probably already spent. So you can imagine that businesses that file bankruptcy had a lot of creditors, a lot of payments that they sent out, and uh, as a result, uh, there would have been more than 50 uh, cases just in any uh, one bankruptcy proceeding. Okay, and then one other question. What experience do you have in being involved in our tribe? I have not actively participated in the tribe. Uh, I have not been on any boards. I have not served on any committees. Uh, so I, I cannot uh, mislead you in any way. Have you attended any of our functions or events? <clears throat> uh, I have. Uh, I've been visiting uh, uh, most recently, but historically, no. You know, you sound like a wonderful person, and we share many friends. I, I'm willing to bet, and I'd probably like to take you to lunch. But I can't vote for you today. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Councilor Buzzard? Yes, and I, and I think the uh, <coughs> comments or questions that I had intended to ask you have already been asked. I tell you that I'm impressed with your interview today. Thank you. I, uh, just some things that bothers me that, <coughs> that I won't be supporting you, but, but I think you have got it. 
One thing that stood out for me is the Cherokee Bar Association. Why mm -hmm. weren't you involved with the Cherokee Bar? The other thing that uh, I had a question about is the experience. Uh, experience, experience, experience goes a long way mm -hmm. when I look at a person or when I interview a person. The other thing is involvement with our tribe. I just feel like that you're going to be one of our justices here, that you're going to be dealing with uh, everyday people. I don't feel like you have the understanding of some of those because you haven't been around us. Uh, you went to Westfield School and participated in the uh, programs there, but still, I'd like to see someone that uh, has interacted with our Cherokee people, our Cherokee holidays, our Cherokee culture, Cherokee government. So. For those reasons, I won't, but I think you'd, you'd make a good one someplace. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anybody sir. else? Councilor Warren. Yes, sir. Uh, just to uh, comment, uh, listening to all the, this is good going around. Nice to meet you. Nice to uh, meet you. Very impressive. I think it comes down to uh, prioritization of what is your priority when you're looking at some of these things? And I've heard several, you know, when you apply for a job at the government, it's the KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities. Um, you know, and some of us, uh, you know, we've got the knowledge, uh, the skill set has been went and she obtained that skill set. The ability, uh, that's always something that's yet to be seen in a lot of cases. I'll tell you, it, you know, the things that, I, that I've sat here and listened to, I, I, I faced those similar questions when I chose to uh, step up and run for council. How many on this council that sat on this council knew Brian Warner? Raise your hand. Okay, just, you know. Uh, just barely. Just, just barely. Just barely. Well, we didn't vote for uh, that's, that's right. That's right. Uh, but, you know, that was always, that was something, you know, the voter rec, and I, and I respect all those things. Uh, you know, looking back on that, some of the things that I value right now, I'm just sitting here, is that non-biased opinion. It's hard to find somebody that doesn't know a whole lot of folks. That's what I used uh, for myself when I came in was that, you know, in Sequoia County, believe it or not, I'm related to my mother, who is non-Cherokee. Uh, my father, he was gone. You know, he passed away. My grandfather had passed away. Uh, my only family was uh, my wife, you know, so I, I didn't have that big support, but that it, it was something that I used to my ability that I was non-biased and I, I thought about spreading those things across that county. So, you know, just some of the things that I think of when I'm sitting here listening to Ms. Uh, Baker talk about those things. That's something that I prioritize very high is, you know, where can I find that non-biased opinion that fits on a court system? Where can I find the knowledge? Where can I find somebody that has the skills? And, you know, and the ability, you know, obviously if anybody that she, the drive is there, you know, I mean, I, I heard, I see a driven individual to catch the red eye. You know, I mean, and that, and you know, and that's not even giving you the backstory of maybe what was going on in the periphery of this individual's life. So, uh, you know, and I do know a lot of other female Cherokee lawyers. I was contacted by a few and had some other things and just other other folks. But I am, uh, I'm willing to, uh, I'm willing to toe the line with Miss Baker with my support today. That's all. Thank, Thank you so much. Anybody else? Councilor Austin. Uh, yes, Ms. Baker, it is nice to see you again. Uh, I, um, I, I'm enthusiastically looking forward to your service on the, uh, the court. Uh, I actually graduated high school in uh, I know the, the people in the community where you grew up. Uh, just for the record, uh, I dated a girl who went to the same church she did. <laughs> and then uh, uh, my wife is a uh, Westville graduate like you are. Uh, and in looking at your resume, I always believe in checking references. Um, I looked and saw Dorner Saunders was your um, beginning career uh, law firm. And uh, a, a fellow who I went to high school with and school with, a lifetime friend named Tom Ferguson, is managing partner there. Tom, it was her 
the, the, the litigation, I don't know. Anyway, she, she was his litigation team during her beginning career. So I called Tom and uh, he, he's telling me about what a bright, uh, bright star she is. And uh, then I know your association in the Catoosa community, I know your association there, you're just talking about uh, uh, Marshall McMillan. Uh, literally, the McMillan family and the Baker family share property lines, I believe, in, the, in Catoosa. Uh, certainly not unknown in the world in which I live, in the world in which I've came from. Uh, I actually am enthusiastic to say that uh, we get a lot of accusations of nepotism in our appointments. This is one case where nobody can blame nep nepotism in any case. There is not a, uh, a way to uh, say nepotism is here. Uh, too often times, our, our, um, we have too many people coming from the same pool. And uh, uh, I, I am very encouraged to see that we've got somebody from our, our uh, whose history is not from uh, the heart and soul here of Tahlequah, Oklahoma, but rather from uh, Catoosa and Westville, where it's a, a broader area, and who uh, is not tightly connected uh, familiarly with the uh, powers that be uh, in any of our systems. Uh, I think it's new blood, and it's a good thing, and I support that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Yes. Everybody? We good? Uh, you can I ask have a one question. more. Miss Baker, what did you do in the period of uh, was it 2017? Excuse me, 2016, I think, to 2017 in June. There's a, a gap. What were you doing on those years? I'm so, I'm sorry. There's a gap where? On the years that you were employed, I was just curious. What did you do from June 2016 to June 2017? There's nothing listed. Oh, I, I'm sorry, that's a typo. I, I began Family Legacy and Wealth Council in uh, July of 2015, and I've uh, been with the firm ever since. And uh, is Norma Welch call your grandmother? No. Thank you. Councilor Dobbins. Yeah. Ms. Baker. Yes. Uh, this is off the subject, but i got to ask it on a TU grad. Okay. You got a law degree at TU and O2. It says joint degree, masters in biological sciences at TU. How'd you pull that off? Yeah, that, that was that was a fun one. I uh, <laughs> I didn't know they even offered yeah. that. Off. <laughs> so I graduated from John Brown University with an undergraduate degree in biology and chemistry, and I applied to both the biology program at TU for a master's degree at the same time I applied for my law school admissions and received admissions to both departments. So I took my first year of studies in the law school. And then beginning my second year, I would be enrolled full-time in the law school, but I was also enrolled part-time in my biological studies program. So I jokingly would say that on Mondays and Wednesdays, I was studying you know, evidence and contracts. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I was studying ecology and fungi and, and a variety of things. So uh, over the course of those two years, uh, on average, I would say I probably had 19 or 20 hours per semester uh, in addition to my extracurricular activities, such as being on the trial team and, and journal and so forth. Um, and so anyhow, I was fortunate enough to graduate with both degrees on the same day. Yes. Good. <clears throat> you know, you have an impressive background. Thank you, sir. Uh, and the experience in, in Indian law, you know, the, the questions were brought up here. And I agree with some of the questions and concerns that, that my council members have here. But at the same time, I see that, that desire, that, that, that wanting to succeed, that passion that, that you have, and not connected to any of these council members here, which is the first thing I ever look at about uh, relationships. You know, who's connected here? First cousin, second cousin. And it's hard to do that in a tribe, that you, you, you point somebody at this level that's not kin because of the way we are as Cherokee people. I mean, you're connected somewhere if you do the genealogy, right? Of course. But at the same time, I'm, I, I'm willing to, to, to support you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm a pretty good people person. And uh, you look like the type that will, will give us the best, non-bias. And uh, I think you'll serve us well. And the experience that you lack, I think you have that passion to get that experience really quick because you're not the first that's come through this, uh, this council with hardly any experience at all. 
and, and we've put them in that position before. Uh, so anyway, uh, you have my support. I'm, I'm on. I'm on a. Uh, like Jamie Hummingbird said, we're going to roll the dice. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay. So having said that, if you have any more questions, Councilor Walkins, stay. Uh, you know, just listen to everyone's comment around here. You know, uh, you know, being the largest tribe in, in, the, in the United States and having the most sophisticated court system, you know, I think we, we should demand, you know, knowledge, like Councilman Moore said, and, and excellence. But, you know, but... Uh, Going back to the Councilman Warner's uh, conversation about you know being unbiased, you know I mean, anyone uh, appointed in, is inherently uh, biased. You know, uh, you, you get rid of the bias by getting elected. That, that's how you get rid of being biased is you get elected. Being appointed, there's there's going to be a little bit of, of bias there. But uh, anyways, for saying that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about this, our tribe and our court system, and, uh, you know, I wish it the best. And uh, we try to keep it culturally uh, as we can. Uh, so, anyways, uh, that's, that's all I have. Thank you, Speaker. Okay. All right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. aye. Okay, you got one, two, three, uh, four. Roll call, Speaker. Roll call. Okay. Roll call, Shelly. Yes, sir. Keith Austin? Yes. Harley Buzzard? No. Joe Bird? Yes. Sean Crittenden? Mike Dobbins? Yes. Frankie Harkis? Yes. Wanda Hatfield? Yes. Rex Jordan? Yes. Dick Lay? No. Mike Shambaugh? No. Mary Bakershaw? No. Theo Smith? Yes. Janice Taylor? Yes. Victoria Vasquez? Yes. David Walking Stick? No. Brian Warner? Yes. Bill Anglin? No. Ten yes, six no. Motion passes. Okay. Congratulations. You know, it's good that the council asked tough questions like this. If we just come in here and within two minutes we do it by acclamation, that doesn't really serve us well at all. And uh, we appreciate your patience and, and taking our question. No offense to, to no, you. I mean, this is, this is our responsibility. Yes, this is our due process. I appreciate it. I appreciate all of your time. And for those of you that went out of your way to uh, check into references and so forth, but I appreciate that. And I'll take you up on that lunch date sometime. Okay. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, before we adjourn, uh, I've got a special person that's here that's served us well for, for years, and, and he just announced his retirement. He's been head of security for, uh, for, for quite some time, and he always makes sure that we have our parking area. He takes care of uh, uh, the holiday parking, and, and, you know, he treats all you council members like VIPs. He always has. And uh, you don't have to ask him uh, twice. When he came to the Cherokee Nation, he brought a level of integrity and, and really raised a bar in law enforcement as head of our security. And just a small token, uh, we have a special gift from him, uh, one of these nice uh, watches with the Cherokee seal on it for the many years of service, Mr. John Payton. Let's give him a... John, you, you, you want to say something? I know you've got other people waiting on you. I've been giving a lot of thought. <laughs> past two months. All my life, basically. And I would like to share three of the highlights with you. Number one, I'm still married to the same woman I married 61 years ago. We still had as much of a relation as we did when we first got married. <laughs> now, the second thing is, is, I graduated from high school on Friday. I was in boot camp in the Navy on Monday. For an old boy from Park Hill, Oklahoma, that was a real culture shock. But if you want to talk education, when I came out of there, I was well educated because <laughs> I worked with people from New York, Chicago, 
you name it. I did my four years. I, right out of boot camp, I went to Corbin school and became a corpsman. <coughs> then, after core school, my father always told me, he said, never volunteer for anything. Well, I noticed that they was asking for a volunteer corpsman for the submarine service. I volunteered for it. Went to New London, Connecticut in the winter time for training. After I got out of there, I was fortunate enough, I got assigned to the Navy's SS-571. I don't know how many of you know what that is, but that was the Nautilus. I was the corpsman. I was the doctor, because we didn't have doctors on the ship, but I was a doctor. I was a preacher, sometimes a psychologist. Wore lots of, lots of hats. The greatest honor I had with my military service at that point, on July the 22nd, and you can all look this up if you like, on July the 22nd, 1958, we had the highest military securities that had ever happened. The Nautilus, the 571, we went underwater in the Barents Sea. We resurfaced two weeks later in Greenland. We sailed under the North Pole. For that, we got recognition from the President of the United States, and I have it on my wallet at home, what they call the ribbon. And I have that on my wall. I'm very, very proud of it. Got out of the Navy and thought I'd never have another bad day in my life. <laughs> things were wonderful. Married, <coughs> kids, things were looking good. Exactly, almost six years later, I got a letter from the Defense Department that Vietnam had started up. They were so short of medics that they reactivated me. I went to Vietnam this time. They flew me from San Francisco to my town, Vietnam. I flew over the North Pole. Needless <laughs> <laughs> to say, you've been over. They, my nickname was Over and Under. <laughs> I spent seven months there as a combat medic. Unfortunately, I got a little bit of a mortar shell in me, and they sent me home. That was the second highlight of my life. I, like I say, when I came out of there, I was pretty well educated, but one of the nice things I found out, this old Park Hill boy did, the Navy paid me to go to school. Got my degree, and it was all paid for. Last but not least, let me, and I know we're running late. When I came to work for that gentleman right straight ahead of me there, we had some rough times. I spent about two years, <coughs> and then they put me over security. So the way I'd like to leave this with you over security, I was over security for over for 18 years. So I have a lot of experience. So therefore, I'm not taking any questions. <laughs> Maybe adjourn. I'm going to hand this to uh, uh, John. Uh, this is from the council. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get a picture of all the council members. Need a motion to adjourn. The whole council. Are we adjourned? Yes. Yeah.